really, <clears throat> from Christmas. And as we prepare for that, and we're already in the season, and you're busy um, shopping and seeing Christmas decorations and maybe getting last minute things done and getting ready for family get togethers and, uh, and all of food preparation and all those things. Sometimes we as adults, um, we sort of, it's interesting to watch little children, isn't it? Their first Christmas or maybe the first Christmas they really understand and the awe that they have about it. They're awed at the decorations, they're awed at the music, they're awed at the presents, they're awed at just all the specialness about it. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder, well, am I as an adult really that awed about it? <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of busyness with Christmas. I've heard people say this is the busiest time of year, year end, and everything we need to get accomplished, financial, uh, as year ends, and getting ready for parties and families. And Well, why do we struggle to be awed with Christmas? I want to think about that this morning. Sometimes, um, maybe we're puzzled. And... Yes, we know the story. We, we, we know the account, the biblical account of how Jesus Christ came to earth. And yeah, we know that's important. But I think perhaps we need to be reminded and renew our wonder. And part of the situation is most of us, or well, maybe you came to faith in Christ late in life. Maybe you didn't really know much about uh, biblical things. Then that might be different for you. A lot of us have grown up with the story of Christmas, the account of how Jesus came, and, and, and really having put our faith in him, this is normal. And yet it's good for us to realize what it would be like without Jesus Christ. What if he didn't come? What if God had not sent his only son as a little baby? And I want to think about that this morning a bit. I want to realize with us together that at Christmas, we celebrate the great light that God sent to us to dispel the great darkness in this world of sin. And this Sunday and next Sunday, next Sunday, Christmas Eve, Sunday, we will um, look at the light next Sunday. We'll focus more on that. But today, in order for us to be awed and amazed and appreciate that great light, we need to remind ourselves of the darkness. Why did he come? What effect did it have? What if he had not come? That's part of the awe, I think, in our understanding Christmas. The Bible reveals to us patterns of darkness and light. Those are big themes in the Bible. Take your Bibles with me and turn with me to Genesis number chapter 1. We begin right at the very beginning, Genesis 1, and we see this theme of darkness and light. And I simply want to read for you Genesis 1, follow along, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And on goes the creation account. And at the end, of course, of each day, God says, this is good. The light chased away the darkness. And that's a big part at the beginning of God's creation. And then we don't have time to read it, but you know that Genesis 3, that light, that pureness, that holiness, that fellowship that Adam and Eve had with God directly, walking and talking with him in the Garden of Eden and so on. That changed back to some darkness because sin entered the world. Adam and Eve made a choice. They made a choice. God gave them free will. And they made a choice to obey Satan. 
and disobey God's command. And that plunged the earth back into a darkness. Um, the Bible tells us that the earth now lies in the lap of the wicked one. And Satan has a lot of influence here on earth. And he tries to influence us. And it's separated man from God's fellowship and death. Not only physical death was a result of that, but spiritual death. Being separated from God for eternity. Darkness. We try to compensate. We try to cover up this darkness as best we can in many ways in, in our world. We somewhat become normal, used to it, in fact. We need to be reminded of the truth that darkness, of that darkness and our tremendous need for the light of God. Now, I've always imagined that as Adam and Eve sat around the campfires, you know, they lived for hundreds of years. Um, I believe Noah's grandfather knew Adam, if you'll think of all the genealogies. Uh, the many times they could sit around the campfire and I imagine... It would be tempting for every child and young person to re-ask Adam and Eve, tell us the, the account again of the Garden of Eden. What was it like? Because it was vastly different. And I imagine that Adam and Eve would have to recount that with some sadness because nothing in the world then and ever since has been anything like it was in the Garden of Eden. Then we come to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, God promised the coming of a great light to overcome Israel's darkness. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, fairly big book in your Old Testament, so hopefully you can find that. Chapter 9. Isaiah, chapter 9. The prophet Isaiah is in a way preparing the children of Israel, the nation, um, for captivity. I mean, they are not walking in God's light they've been given. They are living in sin, and uh, he is trying to, to warn them, but he also gives them God's promises of a future. And that there will be a remnant, of course, and God will bring that remnant back into the land and so on. I want to read, and you follow along, Isaiah 9, first seven verses. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. And when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the Gentiles. Stop right there. What is he talking about? He's describing the northern part of the kingdom of Israel, Galilee. Uh, this is where these two tribes, uh, their land was. And he's mentioning some key words here that, of course, are familiar. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. He's talking about them being oppressed. Well, the armies were going to come by the way of the sea, that road, and oppressed. They were going to actually take over the northern kingdom uh, of Israel. Uh, so he's talking about that. But now, verse 2. The people who waited in darkness, he's talking really about uh, Israel, especially northern part. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. A great light. Verse 2 prophesies that a great light would come to the people who walked in darkness and then notice verse 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. Well, they weren't living in great joy in Isaiah's day. They were under threat. And prophet Isaiah was telling them the nation's going to fall. They're going to go have captivity. But God is promising them someday there's going to be a great light come and it's going to bring great joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, and in the day of Midian, and every warrior's saddle from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. This coming light is going to bring 
release for the people, salvation, rescue, great joy. They're going to be established again as a nation in the land. And then notice verse 6 and 7. How is this going to be? For unto us a child is born. This great light is going to be a child. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is a promise. It will happen. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will definitely perform this. Great a light coming, a great joy. And we see some of the names that we see over here on this uh, tree representing Jesus Christ coming from this very passage. We'll focus more on that uh, next week. This great light was going to be a child, a person, who would become a great king, as the children sang. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew. Matthew 4, verse 16. Matthew quotes this passage that we have just read from Isaiah and tells us about its fulfillment. I'm going to really start reading for the context back in verse 12. Matthew 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. Interesting. He's going back up into this land that Isaiah talked about, this northern part. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The Galilee, the northern kingdom, which was taken by the Gentiles. And then he says, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' beginning message in his ministry was, The kingdom is here. Why? Because the king is here. I am the king. I am that son of man. I am the son of God. The king is here. I am presenting you the kingdom. So Matthew says this was fulfilled, this child in Jesus Christ. He being the great light. Now, again, we have to imagine the darkness. It's hard to imagine the, the people of Israel under siege. Uh, they know armies are coming. Isaiah's telling them that they're going to go into captivity. It would be a very dark time. Very hard to have hope. And Isaiah tells them there's great hope in that God is going to someday reverse that and uh, overrun the oppressors and the invaders and send a great, great light. Without the coming of Jesus Christ, I can't forward the slide for some reason. Um, without the coming of Jesus Christ, our world would be in great darkness. Alvin Schmidt wrote a book uh, about how the world has been affected by Christianity. And I think it would help us to think about our world today, and we take for granted a lot of things, and we have a kind of a normal, we get used to it. But without Jesus Christ, it would be very different. First of all, Christianity, the coming of Jesus Christ and uh, the growing of Christianity in the church, rejected the idols and the pagan gods of the world. You know, it's kind of hard for us to put ourselves back and, and kind of imagine how it was. 
Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of idol worship. We read about that in the Old Testament as the prophets um, were woe against idol worshipers. God, Jesus Christ, or, or God came and, and pronounced judgment against people who were worshiping idols and so on. We know some of what was happening. Unfortunately, as we move away from God in our world, literal material idols are being reproduced. We haven't maybe seen a lot of that in our, especially our Western world, but you know, last year, Iceland announced that they are building a temple to the gods of their past, of the past ages. Designs were revealed in 2015 for Iceland's first pagan temple in over 1,000 years. The temple is to be built in Iceland's capital city and will house a shrine to the Norse gods, Thor, Odin, Frigg, from the Asatru religion. It will give Icelanders the opportunity to publicly worship at this shrine to these gods. The high priest of this religion says Norse paganism experienced a revival in Iceland beginning in the 1970s that paved the way for this new temple. Some of these Asutru gods have recently seen a surge in America as well, thanks to Marvel's blockbuster films about them. If some Christians in the Western Hemisphere were to take a literal look they say, at the new altar to the pagan gods, they might consider it satanic, even though the high priest tries to refute that claim. Can you imagine that? Now, another interesting thing, UNESCO, part of the UN, in the name of preservation of the art of ISIS destroyed city of Palmyra. You remember that ISIS took the city and destroyed uh, lots of old remains there? Well, a section of the UN is trying to revive those statues and so on. And why did ISIS, Islam, destroy them? Because they're ancient gods. And so, um, they're being reproduced and displayed around the world. A couple of weeks ago, a multinational group recreated a statue of Athena. I need my slide to... Uh, this is not working totally here this morning. Athena, the Greek goddess of war. There we got a picture of this recreated statue. It once stood in Palmyra, Syria, before ISIS destroyed it. And now they've placed it where? In the United Nations building in New York City. It is also believed that the Greek goddess Athena was based on the earlier Mesopotamian goddess Asherah. That's a biblical Old Testament name, isn't it? God often hated the worship and, um, and said strong things about people who worship Asherah. And here is the statue. Now, you might say, well, why would the UN want a goddess of war standing there? Well, they say, you know, really, she's peaceful. No, she has a spear. She's the goddess of war. That's what it was from the Greeks. We have idol worship coming back. Christianity has suppressed idol worship. Otherwise, the world would be full of this, much like it was before Jesus Christ came. A second effect, there would not, without the coming of Jesus Christ and Christianity, there would not have been any good effects upon our world by people like, well, for instance, John Huss, who uh, translated the Bible to English. Martin Luther, we just came through a celebration of Martin Luther and how he affected the church. Um, re, rediscovering in a way, repopularizing justification by faith uh, uh, in Christ alone. Johann Sebastian Bach, some of you uh, musicians, you know, value the musicians of the past. Wilbur, William Wilberforce, who in England fought slavery. David Livingston, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or C.S. Lewis, just to name a few. There are many, many more. Without the coming of Christ, our world has been affected by these people. There would be no effect. Also, there would be no value on human life. Infanticide, killing babies. Child abandonment. Abortion. Human sacrifices. And suicide would be much more rampant. More deformed and frail babies would be killed. More infant girls would especially be targeted for death. There would be no Christians to rescue these people and care for them. Our view today of human dignity, the sacredness, sanctity of life, comes from the coming of Jesus Christ. 
sexual immorality would run rampant. Alan Schmidt has written, and I quote, by opposing the Greco-Roman sexual decadence, whether it was adultery, or fornication, homosexuality, child molestation, or bestiality, and by introducing God-pleasing sexual standards, Christianity greatly elevated the world's sexual morality. It was one of its many major contributions to civilization, a contribution that too many Christians today, who nominally comprise about 83% of the American population, no longer seem to appreciate, much less defend, as feverish efforts are underway to bring back the sexual debauchery of ancient paganism. Unfortunately, as we move away from God, sexual immorality and abuse is growing again. During the Old Testament time, we think about these idols and this worship and the pagan temples and what happened there. During the Old Testament time, people would worship at a pagan temple and have sex with temple prostitutes for the rest of the worshipers to watch. The babies which resulted from these adulterous acts were offered to the idols and burnt as a fiery sacrifice. Today, people watch sex through pornography and abort the babies. Wow, the farther we get away from this Christian foundation, how Christianity, the coming of Christ, has affected our world, we return back to some of those dark, dark things. Women, without the coming of Christ, women would not have received as much freedom and dignity in our world. In many cultures unaffected by Christianity down through history, and even today, women were and are treated as property of men, as inferior to men, and sometimes equated with evil. They were often killed at or shortly after birth. The actions and teachings of Jesus Christ raised the status of women to a level that had never before existed. By word and deed, he went against the ancient taken-for-granted beliefs and practices that defined women as socially, intellectually, and spiritually inferior. He once said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, John 10.10. 10. If any group of human beings was in need of a more abundant life, spiritually and socially, it was the women of Jesus' day. And what a great effect he had on our culture today. Christianity brought a great reduction in slavery. The abolition of slavery and the rejection of segregation are rooted in the early teachings of Christianity. It was freely offered to all individuals, classes, and nations. At the time of Christ, as we may not, you know, understand this, at the time of Christ, 75% of the population in ancient Athens, Greece, and over half of the Roman populations were slaves. What a great percentage. Paul in Galatians um, and in Philemon, and Philemon, he told uh, Philemon that he was to no longer keep Onesimus as a slave. He was to treat Onesimus as a brother. Paul told the Galatian Christians that they were neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, for all are one in Christ Jesus. The coming of Christianity erased lots of lines, lots of um, looking down on other people, and every person was clearly taught was equal in worth to God and could come to Jesus Christ and, and be brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. That changed history. Without Jesus Christ, there would be no charitable acts to needy human beings. At the time of Christ, offering care to the poor, ailing, or dying was not common. It wasn't practiced. Giving was seldom done without expecting something in return. Christianity emphasized love for others. 1 John 4, 10 through 11, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That was revolutionary in Jesus' day. Philippians 2.4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. It is Christianity 
that taught that to the world and affected um, the, the idea of giving to others in charity. Without Jesus Christ, there would be no compassion on other human beings. Plato and other philosophers held that a poor man should be left to die if he could no longer work. That was the philosophy of the day. If you can't work, no use for you anymore. Leave them to die. The Greco-Roman considered the hungry, sick, and dying not worthy of human assistance. Jesus flew in the face of that. Jesus had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Matthew 14, 14, and when Jesus went out and saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. That was very anti-cultural, and that is one of the reasons the Roman Empire um, persecuted Christians, because they were very anti-cultural in how they treated people. Early Christians gave compassion to the sick and dying with no thought of anything given in return. They also cared for orphans and the aged. In short, and I quote, every time charity and compassion are seen in operation, the credit goes to Jesus Christ. It was he who inspired his early followers to give and to help the unfortunate, regardless of their race, religion, class, or nationality. These early Christians set a model for their descendants to follow, a model that today's modern secular society seek to imitate, but without Christ's motivation. They don't know why they do it. They just know it's a good thing to do. Without Jesus Christ and his coming and Christianity, there would be no hospitals or no health care. In Matthew 25, 45, Jesus taught his followers to treat others as they would treat Jesus himself. It says, then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And it was Christianity in the church who suddenly began to see everyone in light of this teaching and everyone that they could reach out and help because they were helping people whom Jesus Christ loved. And it was as if they were helping Jesus Christ. There would be no hospitals or health care. Heeding his words, Christian not only opposed infanticide, abortion, and abandoning children, they cared for the sick. Their particular circumstances or who they were, non-Christians or pagans, made no difference. They followed Christ's example of healing the blind, lame, deaf, palsied and lepers. In every healing, Christ was also concerned for the individual's spiritual well-being as well, and so were the Christians. This was in drastic contrast to the Greco-Roman world. Dionysius, a Christian bishop of the third century, described the existing behavior of the pagans toward their fellow sick human beings in an Alexandrian plague in about AD 250. The pagans, he said, thrust aside anyone who began to be sick, began to be sick, and left, kept aloof even from their dearest friends. They cast the sufferers out upon the public roads half dead and left them unburied and treated them with utter contempt when they died. You can read accounts of the plagues that happened even in Rome and how people left the city, all the doctors, all the medical uh, facility people left the city. It was only the Christians who were persecuted, who stayed in the city and ministered to the dying and the sick. Yes, they put themselves at great risk for the plague. And they ministered not only physically, they ministered spiritually as well. And actually, even though they were greatly persecuted, that helped to spread Christianity. Because people who had not been interested in Jesus Christ watched the tremendous difference in response between these Christians and their pagan friends and even medical staff. This was in drastic contrast then. Because of the severe persecution during early Christianity, for three centuries, Christians could only care for the sick as they found them. It was not until AD 369 that the first hospital was built. Evidence indicates the hospital included rehabilitation units and workshops that allowed unskilled patients to learn a trade during recuperation. This shows an even higher level of humanitarian 
awareness, further exemplifying the spirit of Christ in his followers. They weren't just concerned about getting this person healthy. They were concerned in helping this person live a much better life afterwards. More Christian hospitals were built, either as separate units or attached to monasteries, and by 750 had spread from continental Europe to England. The average hospital today is no longer based on charity. Uh, they no longer do it for free, do they? The precedent that the early Christian hospitals sat no longer alleviate, no, not only alleviated human suffering, but also extended the lives of multitudes of people, whether rich or poor, didn't matter. Moreover, these institutions reflected Christ's love for mankind. Today, this innovative humanitarian contribution, the hospital, is unanimously appreciated throughout the world. Christianity also initiated the establishment of mental institutions, professional medical nursing, and the Red Cross. All of things were started by Christians. Fielding Garrison, a physician and medical historian, remarked, and I quote, the chief glory of medieval medicine was undoubtedly in the organization of hospitals and sick nursing, which had its organization in the teachings of Christ. That's where it came from. Now, today we see the same illustration, do we not? There are hospitals in all kinds of places that are run by missionaries, that are run by missions, that are run by the church. We see that when we go to Africa. Um, the hospitals and clinics and, and some of out there in the jungle where the people are, are, are mission set up. And of course, we see that even when there's a plague today, do we not? Ebola, just a couple years ago, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Um, as many people were dying, it was predominantly missionary doctors and nurses who were there who risked their lives. Some of them, of course, getting the disease and uh, surviving these two. Dr. Kent Brand Brantley and uh, Nancy, you see there, uh, Moody graduate. Uh, and then, of course, in our own Omaha, we had Dr. Rick Sacra come here to um, uh, enter UNMC and the unit there so he could recuperate from Ebola. And these doctors, they intend to go back to uh, continue to fight that. When Sharon and I taught this summer uh, in July in um, Ghana, we met some, had some students in our class from Liberia, and I asked them about this. Um, that was one of the hospital centers. By the way, Elwa, we're familiar with the great big radio station there in the hospital. That was all turned into um, a hospital for Ebola. And I asked them about that and how they had been involved, and the, one of the students said, yes, I was involved in education. I would go out to areas where Ebola was starting to, to appear, and we would try to educate the people how to keep themselves safe from it and how to treat those that were sick and so on. So again, even today, uh, on the mission field in many parts of the world, it is Christians, it is the church, it is medical missionaries that are there helping people. If Jesus Christ did not come, we would not have that. If Jesus Christ had not come, we'd have much less education today. Jesus Christ, the great teacher, the, the greatest teacher the world has ever known, taught so that those who he instructed would go and teach others. And that was his commission, right? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of of the age and it's his disciples who went out to teach the world based on Jesus being the greatest teacher his disciples responded by teaching others in 150 AD Justin Martyr established catechetical schools in Ephesus and Rome in time these schools included reading writing and other subjects in addition to religion these are the first schools in the mid-1500s, Martin Luther and John Calvin had convinced civic authorities to implement tax-supported universal compulsory education. The origin of universities was in the monasteries. The Benedictines developed the first library system by collecting books and manuscripts. There weren't libraries. In America, in the colonial days, all colleges and universities established in the colonies before the Revolutionary War, with the exception of the University of Pennsylvania, had Christian origins. Education greatly flourished under Christianity. 
If Jesus Christ did not come, there would be no liberty, no justice. Countries such as the United States of America, and this is a quote, where Christianity is ingrained, demonstrate a much greater improvement in liberty and justice than countries where non-Christian religions dominate. Alex D. Tocqueville, if I pronounce his name correctly, recognized the connection when he said, and I quote, there is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. If Jesus Christ had not come, there would not be dignity in labor and economic freedom. The Greco-Roman culture did not value physical work. Manual labor was to be performed by slaves and the lower classes. It was looked upon as demeaning for anyone else to perform these tasks. But Christians assigned dignity and honor to work. Their role model, Jesus, worked as a carpenter. Paul was also a tent maker, a trade skill that supplemented the income he needed while he was traveling. Christians reinforced that a laborer should be paid. Luke 10, 7, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Jesus told his disciples this when he sent them out on their missionary trips. Working became a good, right thing to do. Second Thessalonians, Paul wrote 3, 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Working became not only necessary, it was good. It was to be pursued. The development of a middle class brought the bulk of the population out of abject poverty, which was the case in those days. The concept of private property rights was intrinsic to the newly found freedoms. The commandment, thou shalt not steal, reinforces the concept of private property rights. Parables that Jesus taught, we've studied here in the last couple of months, the parables of the talents, the parable of the minas, found in Matthew 25, the talents. They taught that when this master gave this money to these servants, they had a choice as to how they were to invest it, whether they're gonna invest it, whether or not to, how they were gonna use it. All of these, uh, they, were, they were totally free from the coercion that exists in socialism and communism and so on. The dignity of labor and the spirit of individual and economic freedom so ingrained in Western culture are products of Christianity, of Christian ethics. If Jesus Christ did not come, there would not be any science. Without the Christian belief in one God, there would be no science. God is a rational being and man was created in his image. Therefore, man must also follow rational processes to study God's creation. On this presupposition, Christian philosophers developed the empirical inductive method. Christians, the pioneers of science, branched out into many areas of discovery. We don't have time to list them all. Many Christian scientists have greatly impacted scientific process and discovery and therefore the quality of human life. And we could list a lot of the early scientists who were studying God's creation and knew they were doing that. Without Jesus Christ coming, there would be much less quality in the arts. The impact of Christianity on the art, architecture, literature, and music throughout history is unquestionable. Composers such as Ambrose, Bach, Handel, Mozart, Mendelssohn, Stravinsky, and Vaughan Williams created their masterpieces inspired by Christ's life, death, and resurrection. We do not have adequate time to mention all the effects of Christianity on our world today, nor are we even aware of all these effects. I bet as I read through some of this, there are some of us who say, wow, didn't realize that the Greek or Roman world was so unlike ours in so many of these areas, and Christianity had such a great effect that still lasts in many ways today. In the words of Karsten Theed and Matthew Diacana, I quote, the Christian gospels are the very building blocks of our civilization. The story and the message of these four books, along with the Judaic tradition of the Old Testament, pervade not only the moral conventions of the West, but also our system of social organization, nomenclature, what we call things, architecture, literature, and education, as well as the rituals of marriage and death which shape our lives. Christians 
and non-Christians alike. You know, you can read most of the holidays were based on Christianity and Christian celebrations. A lot of phrases you and I read, I have a whole book of phrases you and I use in the English language that come from Christianity, from Bible. We wouldn't have them without that. On and on and on we could go. Well, our world would be very different without Jesus Christ coming as a baby. And it would be very dark. But of course, that's not all the darkness there would be. Without personal faith in Jesus, the light, people around us still are in great personal darkness. Now, hopefully we've already established this morning that even those who have yet not put their faith in Christ enjoy some of the effects, many of the effects of Christianity, right? They live in this culture. They live in this freedom. Larry Townton, who spoke as a graduate of Grace University, spoke over at uh, Community Bible Church a couple times in the last uh, two years, wrote several books, and he talks about, and one of his books is about this tremendous effect that we all enjoy. He tells once of a radio, um, really debate. He was on radio debating um, an atheist and, and a Muslim uh, from Islam and himself as a Christian. And um, later on in the debate, this atheist, uh, mostly was attacking him as a Christian, turned to the, the Muslim and said, now I do have a beef with you as well. I, I mean, why, if you would, if you would uh, change, if you would convert to Christianity, if you would listen to Larry here and convert, your Muslim people would kill you. They'd execute you on the spot. He said, no, they wouldn't. Yes, they would. Well, Larry said, yeah, why do you think they wouldn't? Because I live in the United States. Oh, well, you experience freedom here that's based on Christianity and freedom that you'd never experience in your home country of Islam. There are even non-Christians have great benefit from Christmas, from the coming of Christ, from Christianity, and all the ways that it's, that it's affected us, whether they know it or not whether they're willing to admit it or not. However, until a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ for eternal life, they are in great spiritual darkness. Can you imagine it? It's hard for some of us to imagine because it's been a while since we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Not to have any hope, no hope in this life, if Jesus Christ had not come, you and I would have no hope in this life upon this earth. We would be in a very dark, dark world. And of course, there's no hope in eternity either. Can you imagine going through life thinking, when I die, I am going to be separated from God for eternity? The Bible in Revelation tells us in the end, the Satan and all of his followers are cast into a lake of fire forever and ever. We don't want to think very much about that, but Jesus actually said more about hell than he did about heaven. Can you imagine going through life? Can you imagine every day being paralyzed by fear? What if something happens to me? Every time you get behind the wheel of your car, know that you could be in an accident. Every possible danger. Can you imagine going to sleep at night? Saying, what if I don't wake up? What if there's a fire? What if there's a break-in? What if I stop breathing? What if? Paralyzed by fear. No hope. No hope of any change. No hope of any rescue. No hope of any possible salvation. No hope of any forgiveness. No hope of any power of the Holy Spirit to have victory over anything in your life. To be a captive of sin, of Satan. Darkness. Not only in our culture and world, but spiritually, personally. Darkness. Oh, what a great light Jesus Christ is. And you know, we probably don't we aren't awed. We, aren't, we don't appreciate that great light because we've been accustomed 
We've become accustomed to many of the benefits of that light. We don't have any idea anymore what the darkness really would be like. Therefore, we don't have an adequate appreciation of Christmas, of the coming of Jesus Christ, of what it's really about. And so many of the people you and I rub shoulders with out there in the neighborhood and at school and at work and in the store shopping, they still don't understand what Christmas is about. Well, it's a holiday about Jesus Christ, but, uh, you know, all the gifts and bells and music and, and all of that, they don't really understand. It has not affected them personally because they've never thought about their need for Jesus Christ, their need to put their faith in him. Oh, if you're here this morning and you don't have that forgiveness, you don't have that hope, then Christmas is your light. It'll change your life. As you put your faith in that baby who grew up, that baby came to die on a cross to pay the penalty for you and me in our place. To take all of the darkness for us, to take God's judgment for us. And he died in our place. And God invites you to put your faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you as your only way to heaven. And when you do that, the Bible promises you that you are forgiven, that you have the gift of eternal life, that you come into a relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. What a great light. What a release. What a rescue. What a salvation. And I encourage you, there should be nothing to keep you staying in that darkness without any hope. Facing a death and eternity without God. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Come into the light. Allow it to fill your life and change you. And of course, for those of us who have that light, we've put our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus told us to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Your light needs to be shining. There are people all around us in darkness. Our world is somewhat dark. Not as dark as it could be, but somewhat dark. You and I need to let our light shine. Jesus said, don't put it under a bushel. Don't hide it. It needs to shine. And this Christmas season, I want to challenge us to let our light shine. We understand what Christmas is really about. It is life changing. It's eternity changing. And we need to let our light shine. We need to spread that light to other people. Don't just keep it to ourselves. Well, we've seen this morning that there was darkness before light. Great darkness. Darkness you and I can't even imagine. And at Christmas we celebrate the great light that God sent to us to dispel that great darkness in this world of sin. We would hardly recognize this world that we live in today if Jesus Christ had not come. Now, have you ever been in a cave? You know, you go into a cave and you follow this guide and they have a flashlight. Maybe there's a few dim lights along the pathway. And they usually get down deep into that cave somewhere into a room where kind of everybody can collect. And, well, they always love to turn out every light, don't they? Why? Because it's a new experience. It's a new experience not to have any light at all. You can't even see your hand right in front of your face. You can almost feel the darkness, can't you? And you begin to imagine, what is down here in this cave, in this darkness? What kind of life forms? What kind of bacteria? What kind of... What kind of damage could they do to me, right? I wouldn't even see them coming. <laughs> what if that flashlight the guide has doesn't work anymore? What if there's no electricity? How are we going to get out of this cave? Okay, the guide knows kind of his way, but what hole and precipice might we fall in? What sharp rock might I bump my head against? What if? Well, it's an exercise in darkness, isn't it? 
And then they turn on that one flashlight. Or maybe he flips a switch and those few lights along the pathway come on. What a relief. What a rescue. Your faith in the guide has been validated, right? He can get the light back on. Oh, it's because of Christmas, Christ's coming, that there is any light at all in this world. I don't mean physical. That was created back at creation. I mean light in our culture. I mean personal light in our lives. It is only because of him. And next Sunday, we'll look more at that light. Father, thank you for the coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can celebrate that at Christmas. And Father, we...